prem our societies are premised on the assumption of there being a self. But from a scientific point of view, I would argue um, that's quite questionable. And yet we have to live with it. That um, most people feel that there's a little person inside their head controlling their movements. And this little person um, we can't have, we talk about as ourself. And I pointed out that there can't be that for a number of logical reasons as much as a number of neurophysiological reasons. Anything which alters the workings of the brain can alter the workings of the sense of self. Anyone who's ever taken a hallucinogenic drug will know that's very true. Suddenly the world is very, very different to it as you previously could have possibly imagined. And so we've got to accept that the mind is a product of the brain. What does it really mean to be you as a person? Are you the voice in your head or are you the one listening to it? Today on Seekers Mind Talks, we have renowned psychologist Bruce Hood joining with us. He is the author of bestsellers ranging from The Self-Illusion, The Domesticated Brain, and his latest work, The Science of Happiness, to name some. If you are a really deeply introspective person who really wishes to understand yourself on a deeper level and how your thoughts and your beliefs shape you as a person, this episode is for you. We discuss on all those topics and how you can understand and look at your beliefs to form better ones and shape yourself as a different individual. As usual, I'm your host Raj and enjoy the conversation with Bruce on The Seekers Mind Talks, the science and spiritual podcast. One thing what I really love about you is the ability to have a peace of mind while holding deep ideas that kind of undermine you. One such idea is the idea of the self, mm -hmm. right? And you are a proponent that the self does not exist as in everybody says. I mean, every day we experience myself as a person, as an individual, but you go on and say that that's just an outcome of a n number of processes that we can't necessarily identify. And... That really earned my respect. And how do you how, how do you maintain your peace with that? And what is that idea actually? Okay, so this is an idea that um, actually it was after my first book. I wrote a book about superstition and why people believe unbelievable things. And the editor noted I I said um, a throwaway statement that um, most people feel that there's a little person inside their head controlling their movements. And this little person, um, we can't have, we talk about as ourself. Uh, we feel that we occupy our bodies. We feel that we initiate actions and control things as if we're kind of a puppet master. And I pointed out that there can't be that for a number of logical reasons as much as a number of neurophysiological reasons. So a logical reason is there can't be a little version of you inside your head because who is inside their head and their head and their head and so on. So you get into the infinite regress or the Russian doll problem. But from a neurophysiological point of view, there is no locus of identity. There is no self-controlling unit, as it were. It's a massively parallel system with a multitude of inputs. And yet, that's not what we experience. We experience consciousness and free will and an integrated sense of experience. And that's the sense of the self. And I call it an illusion. And an illusion means that there's no sense of the self. You do get that experience very profoundly. But an illusion means that something isn't what it seems, and that's what I meant by the, calling it an illusion, that this, this experience of this individual that occupies us um, is actually a construct. Now, that actually is not a new idea. If there's anybody who's interested in Buddhist philosophy, they'll be very familiar with that notion. Um, Buddha, uh, Buddha talked about this. Another, David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, also talked about this when he tried to um, examine his own thought processes, he realized he could find no origin of his thinking. And so he came to the conclusion that the self was a, was a bundle, he called it the bundle theory, uh, of different sorts of experiences and sensations and perceptions. And that's actually generally what's going on and from the neurophysiological point of view. We are a multitude of sensory and perceptual systems, as well as decision pro processing systems. And a large amount of that is unconscious. So we only really experience the output from these deep parallel unconscious systems and that's what we get is the phenomenology of conscious awareness mm. uh, but again um, in the book the self-illusion I talk about how you can 
perturb or disturb or distort the sense of self it, through damage, disease, drugs, anything which alters the workings of the brain can alter the workings of the sense of self. Anyone who's ever taken a hallucinogenic drug will know that's very true. If suddenly the world is very, very different to as you previously could have possibly imagined. And so we've got to accept that the mind is a product of the brain and that brain mm -hmm. is a multifaceted parallel system. What, what does that really mean for humanity? Does that mean that we really need to shift in a very different direction than what we are going through right now? It's a very good question. I think, personally, I think it's, um, for, I, I don't think you're ever going to get rid of that experience because it's so commonplace. You wake up in the morning, you become consciously aware of the world, you start to think about the day, and from the very beginning, you're experiencing that as a coherent person, as, a, as an actor, as it were, as a as a character in your own story. And I don't think you can easily um, abandon that way of thinking. Uh, some people who practice meditation and some people like myself, we're more used to thinking of ourselves as multi multiples or multitudes. But for the common person, I think that'd be a very difficult thing to say. That said, I think it's, uh, it's actually helpful sometimes when you consider the implications of there being no self because I think that can lift a lot of the burden of guilt and responsibility when you recognize that your actions and thoughts are not necessarily under your control. Um, mm -hmm. So I question the notion of free will. Uh, a lot of our, uh, our thinking is actually constrained and guided by external circumstances. And I think that's actually a really important point, but it has major implications for society because if that is true, then that undermines some of the foundations of what we hold to be the you know, the structures of society, such as love, um, responsibility, crime, culpability. If you think about it, if if you can say, well, that person is doing what they did because of a multitude of other factors, that undermines the kind of responsibility. So our our culture is premised, our societies are premised on the assumption of there being a self. But from a scientific point of view, I would argue um, that's quite questionable. And yet we have to live with it. But then again, it's just that one information, but judging by where you're going, you're, you're kind of pointing to the direction that there is no free will. And if, if, if I start to think like that, then I can, I can mm. make myself devoid of any responsibility. Like it's not mine anyway. Just that thought might, just that one single thought might alter one's life path in a very different direction. That's right? true. It, it, it might take you away from responsibility. Like, why should I stress about anything anyway? Because it's all determined. Well, you know, I'm I'm not alone here. And there are many people who disagree with me. So it's like, this mm -hmm. is like a hot debate in in philosophy and in neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience. The, the issue of free will does come down to some extent to how you define it. Um, I mean... In a sense, well, going back to the, the, the responsibility of crime, for example, um, you might say, oh, well, why bother punishing someone if it's not their responsibility? Maybe it was because they were uh, treated badly as a kid or it's their socioeconomic circumstances which have forced them into the situation. Are they truly responsible? Well, you could always counter and say, well, just because they are not necessarily the instigator of their actions, they're, they're kind of, they're reacting to the circumstances. That doesn't mean that crime or punishment is irrelevant because you can always argue that by adding the penalty of imprisonment, that adds another factor into the equation about whether you decide to do something or not. The decision is really the output of all the factors which contribute to whether you should do or not do something. So in that sense, I, I think about it, 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 it I, I just take the actor out of the equation. It's like you're doing a cost-benefit analysis and you're adding up all the, the decisions, uh, you know, all the all the outcomes. And then on the basis of that, you decide either to act or not to act. And so I think that's true of just about everything actually in the brain. It's always a parallel system. Whether you experience, uh, you know, a neural synaptic, you know, impulse is really the outcome of a multitude of factors which are, pl are which are feeding into that. The, the, it's the amalgamation, the summation of all that activity, which decides whether the neuron fires or not. So the brain is constantly, you know, it's a very sophisticated calculating machine in many ways. And so it's taking all this various input and then coming up with some decision to act or not to act. Uh, but but, the, but the, there's no person there looking over like King Solomon and deciding, well, I think I'll do this now. 
it, because that adds another layer that's not necessary. It's an emergent property out of a system which is constantly dynamically kind of guiding its way through the world, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Which which I wanted to direct you to another question, like, am I the voice in my head or am I the person listening to it? Well, that's a good point. I think the voice is, a, I think consciousness is, um, and my, my take on it is, um, it is a way of drawing attention to salient aspects of the calculations. So mm -hmm. if you think about any complex action, there's a multi, let's say you're hungry, okay? Um, you decide you want to go and you're going to go to McDonald's. So you, you can't, you don't know whether you want the chicken or the burger. Okay. So along that chain of decision processes. Okay. And it was initiated by an unconscious process, namely the feeling of hunger. Hunger then is, is a physiological state that then feeds into the brain. The brain interprets that signal as, oh, I think I'm hungry. What do I do? And therefore it sets off a chain reaction of, of how you do it. Okay. So, so in a sense, you don't need to have the actor where we're kind of epiphenomenal, you know, where we're kind of sitting above all the kind of calculations that's going on. But then let's say you get to the um, the checkout window, you're looking at the, the chicken nuggets and you're looking at the at, at the burger and you start speaking, I wonder what I want. Okay, so then you have this conscious kind of evaluation in your head and you're running back over the past. What do I think I want? And then, so that means you're checking back all your past history. When was the last time I had chicken nuggets? And by the way, they weren't that good. And so you're kind of, you do have a, a, a voice and certainly most of us will report that we often hear ourselves talking to ourselves. And I think that's the way that the brain can actually then um, direct attention towards the salient aspects and review them. And so it's really an attentional system. It's just drawing and uh, highlighting the salience of the sorts of choices that you might have. And by the mm -hmm. way, that voice that's in our head, I talk about my new book, The Science of Happiness. Um, very often, that voice is a, a kind of inner critic. Um, we spend a lot of our times reviewing our past choices and worrying about the future. And quite often, it's this inner voice that we experience in our head uh, that we listen to. Now, it's not like we're kind of, I mean, we're getting into very deep, difficult territory about what is the phenomenology of hearing your own voice and so on. But it's kind of interesting that when you're learning to read, for example, Children have to speak it out loud, all right? So when they're learning the words, they literally are saying the words. With experience and practice, they learn to internalize it, okay? So they don't have to mm -hmm. say the words as they're reading. But mm -hmm. if you take an adult who can read silently and you pray, place little electrodes on their tongue whilst they're reading, you can see they're actually speaking the words. They're just not articulating <laughs> them. So in other words, these, these processes, um, unless they require conscious awareness or attention, they can be some subsumed and become automatic. In the mm -hmm. same way that when you're learning a, to drive a car, uh, you're paying all your attention to shifting the gears and trying to coordinate the whole thing. And it requires a lot of attention. So it's but like a self-referential loop. Like nature. Yeah, it becomes, so it doesn't require conscious awareness. So you can do it offline, as it were. So going back to your original point about what is it, you know, am I listening to what I'm saying? I think what happens in those circumstances is you can use language as a way of directing your attention and salience to the various sorts of aspects of the of the task at hand. Mm -hmm. But the Buddhist philosophy takes this one step higher, like you are the one looking at all these, you are the observer above all these. Well, well, in the, in the in Anatta, of course, the idea is that um, enlightenment comes from losing that, um, that observer, um, and that is the path towards, you know, enlightenment. Um, there's a similar, again, um, and going back to my new, I mean, I've got this book, it's coming out in Canada in about a couple of months time, by the way. Um, I talk about the, the route to happiness is really relinquishing and letting go of what I call the egocentric self, because the problem when you view, when you have a very strong sense of self and you're listening to your voice and you're reviewing your problems, we're our own worst critics for a start. But we also tend to blow everything out of proportion because we don't have the right um, comparisons to make. Uh, if people are so self-centered, they very often don't notice that other people are suffering as well. And so one of the one of the suggestions about how to become a happier person is just to shift your attention away from being egocentric to becoming more what I call allocentric or other-focused. Now, we have mm -hmm. to do that anyway as children because children are born very egocentrically. They can't even conceive that other people have different thoughts than they have. But when they start to mature and you know deal with siblings and um, interact in the playground, they've got to learn to understand that other people have different opinions. They've got to become socialized because if they don't become socialized, they'll be ostracized. 
And that's really the worst thing you can do for a child. You, they need to be included. So a lot of development is learning to give up your egocentric view and become moral centric, but we never lose it because of the way that consciousness is from the first person perspective. So as an adult, we might say that we're thinking about other people, but ultimately we're kind of very self-centered. And yet we can train ourselves through various practices and you know various activities that I recommend that we can do to become more allocentric. And the benefit of that is, first of all, it quietens down uh, this inner critic that we all have. Um, it allows you to get things into perspective because you soon discover other people have got other things going on in their lives, which actually explains the way that they've been behaving towards you. You might think that they don't like you, but it turns out that they've got a parent with cancer or something else that is preoccupying them. So it's not that they don't like you, it's because they've got other things going on in their lives. So you start to see the relative, um, the complexity of social interactions, the complexity of uh, people who've got stuff going on in their lives. And then of course, the other benefit is that if you do form these bonds socially and connecting with other people, then you benefit from the reciprocal or reciprocity of, of support. So they're more likely to help you out rather than if you're a real narcissist who doesn't really care about other people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we, we admire narcissists because they seem so, so self-assured and positive. But ultimately, I don't think any of us would really like to be friends with a true narcissist because they just generally take advantage of everyone else. So mm -hmm. yeah, but it, it is tied, the concept of you know the pursuit of happiness and the sense of self, I think are very much related. In fact, all of my books, um, and all of the ideas I talk about um, decompose or deconstruct uh, common sense experiences of, of who we are, our, our rationality, why we do what we do. We think we have an overinflated sense of purpose and reason, and uh, we think we're, we're, we have all these biases and distortions, uh, which are self-serving. Uh, they maintain our kind of positive attitude and um, propel us to goals and ambitions. But we've got to be wary that we've got to understand that there's a whole lot of other consequences uh, of this uh, that people don't generally take into consideration. But um, yeah, I mean, it's there for good reason. It's part of the developmental process. We need a self. We interact as selves. We don't interact as multitudes. Um, we categorize people. We stereotype people. We jump to conclusions because it's quicker and faster just to treat them as sentient individuals who have free will, who are making decisions because that's what they want to do rather than trying to work out what is the complexity of their lives, which determines why they've made their choices. Is, is there any correlation between uh, concentration and happiness? Because I was reading this book recently, The Science of Enlightenment by Shinzen Young. And he said that in many of our traditions, whether it's Hindu, Muslim, uh, Jews, there is different names that in the Buddhist, they call it Samadhi. In, in Muslim terms, I think it was a Sufis, they call it a Fana which is intense concentration mm -hmm. states. And yeah. they seem to take you out of yourself. Is there any correlation with that to happiness yeah. and understanding more about this reality? Well, yeah, and I think the reason, and this is the reason why meditation also works, is that left to your own devices, I'll give you an interesting fact. If people are not working on a task, you know, if they're not focused on something, their mind's wandering about 50% of the waking day. In other words, they're doing other things, they're thinking. And that mind wandering isn't necessarily pleasant. Very often it's negative. It's rumination, it's, it's worrying about things, it's unresolved problems that have been probably up unconscious. But as soon as your mind is off the task, your attentional system starts to turn in on itself and look at itself. So there's a network in the brain called the default mode network. This is the area which paradoxically becomes more active when you're not task focused. And this was discovered by chance. Originally, when they were doing brain imaging studies, they asked people just to lie still and think of nothing because they wanted baseline measures to see what was going on in the brain. And what they discovered was rather than the brain quieting down, what actually happens paradoxically, it starts to become more active. And this is the default mode mm -hmm. network. And the default mode network is a network which represents the self and others. And so the hypothesis is that this is the simulation network in the brain, which is running simulations, reviewing um, things you've done in the past and thinking about the future or your current concerns or whatever. Now, if you are task focused, you cannot simultaneously be working on a task, concentrating on, and also reviewing how badly your life's been going. So in a sense, the concentration that you're referring to um, directs the attention away from this inner dialogue, the default mode network, because attention cannot be split. 
despite people talk about multitasking, that's a bit of a myth. We can't actually multitask. What we can do is switch very quickly between tasks so it looks like we're effectively multitasking. But you really only got one focus of attention or one. I, I, I talk about it like a spotlight, uh, in, you know, like a torch or a, a, a light. And that, that spotlight can be very, very bright and focused. And so it brings up everything in great detail. Or it can be very diffuse and spread. And that's where your attention is broadly spread across the, the thing. And then anything jumps into your mind. But when you're focusing and concentrating, that spotlight is focused. And it cannot simultaneously be focused on a task and reviewing how your life is going up until that point. So that's kind of one of the reasons. The second thing about concentration is there's a state uh, that um, Mahali Csikszentmihalyi, it's a difficult word twist of a name, but he talks about flow. I have the book Flow is this optimal mental state where you're in a situation where you've got a challenge or a task, and it's it's really, um, it's satisfying because it's taxing you, but not overtaxing you. So it's, a lot of sports people find that skiers or anything in the situation where your your mind is focused on the task and it's it's really tapping into your your ability, your skills. I'm in the zone. You're in the zone, exactly. I mean, if a task is too overwhelming, then you get stressed because you can't do it. If a task is too easy, then you get bored, you become apathetic. So it's mm-hmm. that sweet spot, the zone, as you call it, that um, uh, Csikszentmihalyi uh, talked about, which is the matching of your skill set to the task at hand and that and that you should just be a little bit beyond what your skill set is and therefore you can rise and uh, rise and adapt to it so it's a way of actually incrementally improving um uh, and that's the optimum state which incidentally is a kind of interesting kind of model because that fits very much with vygotsky who mm-hmm. talked about child development as that process vygotsky argued that children learn and acquire knowledge in situations where they're discovering aspects about the world, and, they, and if it's in a, if it's structured in such a way that the task is just beyond their ability, they'll rise to the occasion and then learn more and more. So if you if you think about development and cognitive development as this progressive series of tasks and challenges, um, if it's within the child's grasp, as it were, then you'll get progress. If it's too difficult, then they won't even bother or attempt or learn anything. So there, it's this constantly matching, and that's what. Uh, he argued that is the role of parenting and social development. He argued that because we're the experts, we structure the world for the child to set up in such a way that they can acquire these this new information. So I think that's a kind of nice comparison. It's the same sort of mechanism that uh, Flo uh, was talking about in adult mental health, if you like, and, and developmental processes as well. Mm-hmm. But there's no end point to concentration, right? Like I can always have more and more deep concentration. Is that necessarily a good aspect? Well, actually, that's one of the things I do recommend in the book. And it's, it's um, so one of the, th- one of the, um, another aspect of um, mental health is you might've heard about this is mindfulness, uh, mm-hmm. where they get people to kind of savor the moment and, and think and process. And the idea is that the more attention you spend allocating on an experience, the more mindful that you become the, the better it is for you. So there's a mindfulness meditation where you kind of listen to the distant sounds or you focus on your body or you focus on your breath. All of those um, instructions are directing your attention away, by the way, from your inner voice, actually to your bodily sensations, your breathing or external stimuli. So again, it's going back to this point I was talking about that it's controlling the the, the spotlight of attention. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So... Um, uh, so I, I think that, and I'm lost the train of thought there for a moment. Go, that's, true. that's an example where my but, attention but is. But do we really need that inner critic? It might be an evolutionary adaptation for humans, right? But to well, yeah, take your attention, I mean. Bias. So it turns out that we pay more attention to um, negative information and potential threats than we do to, to uh, when things are going right or there's no threat at all. Uh, just about every area of human performance uh, we 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 attend more to things which are potentially threatening, and the reason is is the argument is that it's strategically better to address potential threats rather than deal with things which are going fine because you you have a better advantage. Hmm. But the flip side, well, the consequence of that is that means that we just focus on negative information all the time, which is why the news is full of bad stories. Uh, they've tried many times to run, you know, news agencies with good stories, but people are not interested. Even when they don't want to, people are paying more attention to negative stuff. So there's been studies showing that 
if you tell people they're doing a study about reading, uh, reading a, a, a eye movements and reading a newspaper, okay, um, it turns out they're not actually measuring the eye moves. They're just they're measuring how much of the stories or what aspects of the stories people remember. And people remember the negative information more than even though they weren't instructed to do so. So we can't help ourselves but pay special attention. Um, you know, we spot angry faces in crowds quicker than smiling faces. Uh, screams register quicker than laughter. Uh, a negative review in your, you know, your Amazon book reviews stands out much more than a positive review on your podcast or something like that because they just register much more impactfully with us than when things are going well. So yeah, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the critic inside your head is probably a consequence of that reviewing the situation and trying to improve and make sure it doesn't happen again. And people ruminate a lot. Um, and that's you know one of the reasons, for example, people can't get off to sleep at night because they're going over what went wrong in the day. And then they do the worst thing possible, which is tell themselves to stop thinking. I've got to stop thinking this thought. And that actually is counterproductive. That creates a thing called ironic thought suppression. Because the more you try not to think about something, the stronger the representation of that specific thought becomes in your head. It's the one thing that then stands out. So that's why it's ironic. And in an attempt to stop yourself thinking, you've actually strengthened it. And then, of course, you're monitoring your the content of your thoughts, thought processes, just looking out to see if the thing pops into your head again. So yeah, that was a colleague of mine, Dan Wagner, who showed that phenomenon. And that's why when, for example, in a mindfulness meditation, um, if a thought comes into your head, you're told not to treat it with any additional attention. No, okay, don't just let it float in like a cloud in, in your mind and out, out of your ears. Don't give it any special uh, effort because that you don't want to kind of strengthen it as a representation. Mm -hmm. That idea that uh, you were explaining earlier that about 50% of the day, you are just ruminating in your head. So if you extrapolate it, it's like the whole world is like 50% of the time in 24 hours, zombies walking yeah. around, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's yeah, a very it's destructive kind of, thought, yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to say, yeah, I mean, on one hand, it's kind of alarming because that means that maybe pilots and drivers and people like that are <laughs> ruminating. But I, hopefully we've got enough safety uh, systems built into our transport that it doesn't become a major issue. But but my wondering and, and lack of attention is a well-recognized uh, risk factor in accidents all the time. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, we are, we do have a mind which does tend to go off task a lot. Does, does that mean that the world whole world is operating in 50% capacity? Well, no, because I think it depends on the nature of what you're doing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. And we've got to recognize that the nature of work has changed significantly over the past 200 years with the introduction of technologies and industries and machinery. Um, a lot of, you know, the thing about machines is they make, they make work easier. But they changed the nature of the work. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of what we're doing now is we're looking at screens or monitoring um, you know, various output systems in order to make choices. Like take driving, for example. You know, If you're driving along a route, it's a new route. Well, that requires a lot of your attention, doesn't it? But if you then program in GPS and then you put a, you've got a you know, car which is automatically driving, then of course it doesn't require your attention. So you're bound to then start going off. And now, of course, we've got phones with games, and these games are deliberately designed to be reinforcing to make you, um, you know, I stick your, <laughs> spend most of your time looking at the screens again. So I think, you know, in, in a, you know, not so long ago, um, yes, of course, we've always kind of, um, minds have drifted off, but I suspect it was probably more focused on living day to day, making sure you had the harvest in and, you know, tending the crops or looking after the animals. Uh, and that would have required quite of labor, you know, intensive work. Yeah, even concentration is consistent and constant effort. Like if you do not put concentration to your mind, that's the mind wandering states that we are talking about. And it's laborious. It, it requires you to put constant effort. Uh, yeah. But I would argue that I would also point out there's actually a very satisfying component of um, mental effort, if you like. Um, I talk about explanation as orgasm, and I don't mean to be rude, but there is um there is a phenomenon where you suddenly have a moment of insight where you, where where you understand an explanation, and I think it was David was it David Hume again? It might be David Hume. He said it was better than carnal knowledge, hence orgasm, because you get that insight. And for me, that's always been a very strong, compelling um, motivation for the work I do, um, the the way I think about 
the mind, the way I think, the, the way I think about data, the way I think about experiments and stuff. I think there's something incredibly satisfying when you when you understand uh, something, you know. And I think that's to me one of the most well, that's one of the best experiences you can have, having insight and having that explanation. And that comes with concentration because quite often the the sorts of things I find fascinating are not immediately obvious. You have to really kind of work them through. Uh, and very often they go against your intuition. So that's sometimes why you really got to sit down with paper and pen and really map it out and, and, and do it again. And going back to, I, rem I now remember the point I was trying to make about concentration and, and um, asking questions. In, in my book, uh, I talk about mindfulness as one of the ways of controlling intentional thing. Um, but rather than just kind of focusing on, you know, the sensations of your breathing and the sounds of birds, whatever, one of the things that I recommend is I ask, I get people, I get my students to ask why. In other words, if you walk around your world, all right, walk around, it doesn't matter whether you're out in the forest or you're in an urban environment and you just see something which is unusual. Ask yourself why, why is it like that? And you get into this infinite regress of always coming up with a, another reason, another uh, another point of asking why, you know, why is that building there? Well, okay, someone built it, but why did they build it? Okay, they built it because they needed to have this. Why? And this is a point that Richard Feynman um, made. Um, he said, look, if you ask the why question, you never get to an answer because there's always an antecedent state which goes to a why question. So I I get, I, I think that's a really neat way of becoming mindful of of the complexity of humanity, the complexity of the world is keep asking the why questions. And there you go on a journey of kind of infinite regress, trying to kind of figure out what was the antecedent states that led to what you're observing. So I think that's another way, um, going back to this issue of concentration and mindfulness, how you can actually do that without necessarily just focusing on sensation. Asking questions, why is the world the way it is? Becoming curious again, I think is an incredibly uh, powerful motivation. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something that children do, and then they kind of lose it as they become more formalized in their education. And they stop kind of asking the why questions. They just want to know how. <laughs> how do I pass? What do I need to know? But yeah, I last week I got this sort of epiphany that um, science is just normalized magic. Do you think that way? Because I want to talk about uh, this pro this thing of emergent phenomena. Okay. Uh, I was I was talking to ChatGPT. I was having a chat session, a light session with GPT, and I was talking about emergent phenomena. And if you put like, you know, you have, if you take for water, for example, you have hydrogen and two oxygen. And I was asking it, like, if you take a million water molecules, like, imagine that you never knew that water was liquid. Like, nobody in Earth ever knew water was liquid. Could you predict that if you combine a million H2O molecules, it would make a liquid-like substance. And the answer was like, it's very hard to predict. And once you become normalized with the emergent phenomena, we see that as reality. We can't, we can't predict an emergent phenomena unless it occurs. Am I true to think in that sense? Well, I mean, there's a sort of, uh, it's almost like a, uh, and it's, it's almost like a get out, uh, uh, it's almost like an easy way of dismissing or not coming up with an answer to call something an emergent property. We we often, I, I, I'm guilty of, of doing that as well. I mean, I, I talk about, well, consciousness is an emergent property, but that doesn't really explain anything. It doesn't really provide you with any causal mechanisms. And that's because the trouble is we, we see the world uh, causally, okay? So we need to have antecedents and, and, and mechanisms and then outcomes. Uh, and so... When something is described as being emergent, uh, I mean, we see we see examples of emergent um, properties in, in in the natural world, um, and there's obviously examples of artificial emergent properties. But just kind of describing science is, is only just I, I'm not sure I, I I kind of agree with you on that. Is it's like an emergent phenomenon? I'm not. I mean, it does make predictions. It does has antecedents. I, I mean, the thing about science is it's falsifiable. All right, mm -hmm. and that's always why it's not. You, you put it in the same phrase as magic, and I would say that's absolutely not the case because magic, by na by its nature, um, is not falsifiable. Uh, this goes back to my first book. Um, people believe in magic or superstition. Let's use those words interchangeably because it's easier to think about it that way. 
um, because they have a deep need to believe in these things. Uh, I argued at the end, the conclusion of the book, that we need the sense of the profound. We need the sense of um, the spiritual dimension to life in order to avoid the existential crisis, in order to make, um, in order to kind of give meaning to life, um, to see ourselves as bound together as a group that share the same value systems. That requires a spiritual, profound sense of the universe. Mm -hmm. Because if we're very rationalist and very materialistic, then that doesn't work as a mechanism to bind us together because you're more likely to trust someone if you both have a shared belief system, which cannot be verified by evidence. Okay, that's why religions are so powerful, is because if two, if two people identify with the same belief systems, then they're taking on trust. And in fact, they don't need the evidence. Uh, the evidence mm -hmm. was actually, that's, that would actually undermine it. Because you actually are agreeing on something, on a belief system, then that proves that you are in the same boat irrespective of how much money you have or how intelligent you are. And that's why religions are so powerful and you cannot eradicate them with, with reason. Um, it's, it's precisely why they are so uh, robust. Uh, but we do need this way of thinking because this is how we are as a social animal. And that's why supernatural thinking is it's built into us. And that's I, I talked about that in the way that we think about the world. I said, I said it earlier, we see causality. So we don't believe in chance. Okay, if something happens, it happens for a reason. And often that reason is coached in magical terms. So, for example, there was research trying to educate about the AIDS virus uh, in Madagascar. And they were doing very well explaining the transmission and uh, explaining how a virus works. But, it, but ultimately, once they'd done the education program, um, the locals just said, well, yeah, that explains why someone gets AIDS. But why that person, not another person? So it was like they still wanted to retain some sort of kind of magical aspects to it. And so magic is irrefutable in the sense that you cannot remove it or you can't explain it away. I mean, you can explain magic tricks away, but I mean, true supernatural beliefs like gods and mm -hmm. spirits mm -hmm. and things like that. You can't prove they don't exist because that's a non sequitur. You cannot prove the non-existence of something. Um, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a fallacy of logic. And so people say, well, prove that I'm wrong. Well, you can't. And so they're left with a kind of common um, way of saying, well, science doesn't know everything because it can't prove, disprove my belief systems. Whereas science, of course, by its nature, is falsifiable because it wouldn't be a science unless it was. So, and the, and the interesting thing is that if you take that to its logical conclusion, that means that all kind of science that we have up to now is corruptible or in the sense it's an incomplete uh, picture of the true complexity of the universe. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, we've got theories in physics and theories in chemistry and theories in other biology, and there's no kind of common theory. They they all kind of skirt around phenomenon and describe phenomenon. And and we update our theories and we change them. And sometimes we have new new ways of thinking about stuff. And that's the nature of science. That it. But the good thing about it is is that in a thousand years from time, the things that we have shown now scientifically will still be true. We might have a better mm -hmm. explanation, but the phenomenon won't have disappeared because it is a fundamental component of, of nature, as it were. But mm -hmm. belief systems, because they're socially constructed, well, they invariably will go as populations move. And, go, and we've seen that over the mm -hmm. thousands of years that we've yeah. been around. I remember, remember reading somewhere, science is the child of spirituality. And in some ways that you're speaking, it is a rational belief system. Yeah, well, don't forget. I mean, it was, I mean, obviously there have been um, science before the Enlightenment and, and, and obviously in the, in the Arab states where there were very, very prominent Arab scientists. But generally in the West, we, we, we talk about the Enlightenment as being the transition from the magic. That's why it's called the Enlightenment, because it was the Dark Ages. And then we had light, and that's, and then we had understanding and reason. But the establishment of the Royal Society in the 17th century was, if you like, the kind of point at which science started to get its real pedigree and, and power. Um, everyone, just about everyone in the, of the early science, they were all deeply religious. And their approach was that God has created a very complex universe, but we can look at his amazing abilities in greater detail 
by just building better microscopes and understanding. And they, and they thought about the world as a giant, complex clockwork machine, effectively, built by God. And, and so they weren't denying the existence of God. They're just saying, oh, he's, he's built this incredible uh, systems and we can start to appreciate and understand it. So the science and um, religion, were they weren't conceived as incompatible. It wasn't until it started to, the, the, the discoveries started to undermine what were the doctrines. And that's when it became difficult. So obviously Darwin's um, theory of natural selection completely undermined the, the origin stories. And so that was, well, that's when it really started to become problematic. That said, there were obviously the early pioneers in science who que clearly were, uh, David Hume is one of them, uh, who were clearly kind of uncomfortable with with the, the traditional Christian view of, of, of the world. So science and science and, and I don't, and I, I know scientists today who are religious. So people can operate with different, and this goes back to self religion People can kind of talk about their spiritual self and their intellectual scientific self, and they don't see an inconsistency because they keep those domains, if you like, separate. Uh, and um, personally, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously, uh, well, technically I'm an agnostic atheist, um, but because I, an atheist doesn't think there's no, I don't know is the answer. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I'm agnostic about it. Um, but I don't feel the pressure to try and dissuade people out of their belief systems because they're very, they're very, unless those belief systems impose on the liberties of others, et cetera, et cetera. You know, obviously, you know, that's, that's where religion starts to become evangelical and difficult. But if it provides a comforting sense of purpose and meaning in life and, 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 and it provides all those sorts of things that science can't for them, then fine. I don't see it, I don't see it being as problematic. So I, a, lot, a lot of my colleagues who are very unhappy because I was in one of the early um, in the early uh, atheist movement, um, and I was I wanted to approach it in a much more, in my opinion, um, productive way, a positive way. Say, look, the reason that we believe in these things is actually the way that children think about the world. For a start, they can't conceive of natural selection. Um, they can't conceive as old species having a common ancestor in biology. Uh, and neither can adults, by the way. They can say they understand natural selection, but actually very few people really do understand it because it's actually a very counterintuitive view of, mm -hmm. of biology. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I, so rather than just sort of calling people ignorant and indoctrinated by religion, and that does go on, I say it's probably more likely that religions work because they feed into the, our belief systems, such as, you know, uh, an afterlife. Children can't conceive of death easily. It's a difficult concept for them to get their heads around. Uh, that's why we use euphemisms like, oh, they've gone to the other side or they've gone away because a child can't conceive of someone ceasing to exist. So I think, you know, a lot of the, and spirits are another example, uh, a lot of the kind of core components of religions are actually quite universal. And that's because they tap in to our intuitions about the nature of the world around us. Mm hmm so I was reading this interesting quote from Nietzsche. Actually, it's a, it was like, if you want peace of mind, believe. If you want to know the truth, inquire. And both are mutually exclusive. Yeah. And yeah, uh, and, and having a <laughs> having a superstitious belief uh, sort of takes you off from the responsibility of having to inquire. And you we also yeah. emphasized an important point, a question that I had, like. Why can't we say, I do not know? Because we want to build that, because maybe partly it's because that we want to take that responsibility off our shoulder because it takes effort to find answers and it's easier to believe and yeah. be at peace. Well, there's a number It's there's a number of mechanisms going on. First of all, we are uh, causal determinists. What mm -hmm. I mean by that is, well, we cannot help but see causality. So if some event happens, let, let, let's say... Let's say uh, you're thinking of um, your aunt, my uh, aunt Mimi. Okay, the next you you have a dream about Aunt Mimi. The next day you get a phone call to say that Aunt Mimi has died, and you go, "Oh my goodness, that was a premonition." Okay, um, no amount of explanation in terms of the statistics behind the co-occurrences or coincidences, which happen all the time. It's going to reduce your belief that that is a, that was a cause, that was an auspicious event. Mm 
that was a causally related thing, that your thoughts was a true premonition. But of course, there are lots of things which are pure coincidences, and a lot of things never seem to follow, and so we're not aware of them. But when they do happen, and they're auspicious and noticeable, then you cannot help but see those as causally related. So we, we see everything as being causal. We also like a world which is kind of causal because it helps us kind of understand that, um, you know, life is predictable. If Otherwise, you're faced with the alternative, which is that uh, life is unpredictable, and that's pretty distressing. So people like to have a sense of control. And then, of course, the other power belief is that as I said earlier on, if you share a belief um, with another person and, and you both buy into this belief, then you're signaling your affiliation with something which cannot be proven correct or incorrect. And that's a sign of trust. And that's one thing that we kind of need is the sense of trust. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I had this scientist Gerd Giger and said on my show, and he was talking about this idea of unpredictability. And he was saying that if our life was all well too predictable, it would be boring. It would be like reading last year's newspaper. Every, yeah. Everything was determined. There's nothing new in life. And it's such, when you think about it like that, it's sort of a conundrum. Well, that's kind of, that's the interesting thing. We like unpredictable things. Uh, we get enjoyment out of it. Um, I was just but reading- not too a, much. Not too much, no. You don't want to unpredict, you don't want to totally unpredict. Well, a sense of loss of control leads to distress. But people like, um, you know, like roller coaster rides, they like scary movies, um, they like uh, art and music that is predictable up to an extent, but then has something a bit different. And so we do thrive on the kind of variation. Um, Andy Clark has got a book out at the moment where he argues that the brain is basically a prediction engine. Um, so our whole mode of thinking is basically making predictions about the world and then seeing them through. But he also points out that actually we do like a little bit of uncertainty um, because it seems to motivate us to update our models, as it were. And I think that's probably true. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, Gagagrise is right. If, you, if, if the world was entirely predictable, it'd be, you know, it wouldn't be very uh, fulfilling. Uh, sorry, I lost my chain of thought there. Uh, so in that sense, uh, like, you said that our brain is, new new scientific theories are coming, like our brain is a prediction engine. Is that similar? Yeah. In, in If you speak in that term, is that the way chat GPT or these LLMs work and our brains work? In uh, So do our brains and these LLMs work in similar ways? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, chat GPT, as you know, is a large language model, which is basically um, being made by this um, producing statistical analysis of every possible combination of words which have ever been written and then submitted onto the internet. And it's like a very fancy autocorrect. Um, I, I think that's true. Uh, I mean, certainly this is an old idea that Helmholtz talked about in the 19th century. And then my, my late friend, Richard Gregory, talked about the brain as a hypothesis tester. Uh, the argument is that the world is too complex and it would require too much energy to figure everything out from first principles. So you make certain assumptions, um, hypotheses, and and therefore you just check. So you're predicting what's, some, what's going to happen. And then you use that prediction, you update that. So I think the difference with ChatGPT is, of course, that's retrospective. That's looking at everything that's been before, and then it kind of comes up with kind of an answer, if you like. Um, the brains are, is different. Our brains are actually, yes, it's, it's using past experiences, but then it's updating its own um, models with new experiences and so on. So it's, it's a prospective um, mm -hmm. mechanism rather than retrospective. I also wanted to touch on this idea of our of how our prior beliefs or prior expectations uh, mm -hmm. lead to us interpreting events. So I was reading through your book and you were explaining a story like if you go into a, a house and you had no idea or you do not believe in the ghost or haunted and you will you will assume a causality to it and you hear a sound in that house, you will assume a causality to it. You'll you'll think that, okay, maybe something broke. But if you believe in ghost, which is yeah. your prior expectation, the whole experience changes. And yeah. that sort of um so so that sort of conclude makes conclusion makes us to conclude that we love to live in imagination and how much of our world do we see as imagination than reality? So what's the whole idea there? 
Well, um, so there's a couple of things in there. I mean, what you were describing is what's called Bayesian theorem, um, which is you use past experiences to make kind of educated guesses about the likelihood of events. Um, and Bayes is, uh, people have often talked about um, reasoning and thinking also being very similar to Bayesian. Um, I'm not an expert in that area, but it, it falls into the general idea is that you use context in order to interpret. And that's absolutely true. I mean, the brain is a comparison engine as well, as, as much as a prediction engine. In other words, uh, you don't have any direct contact with reality. That's a statement I've made many times before. And what I mean by that is that your entire uh, mental life is a representation of the external world as modeled in your head. And that means that the models that you generate are the realities that you experience. So you don't actually have direct contact with reality. It's correlated, but it's not identical to it. And so the reality or the models that you create depend on what kind of aspects of the reality you are paying attention to. So that means that all your choices and decisions at the neural level are really to do with the sorts of comparisons or the contexts in which you are making those sort of models up. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why, I mean, to give you an example, so you, your listeners can get a sense of it. the saltiness of food will depend on what you've just eaten, okay? Or the loudness of a sound will depend on whether the room is quiet or not. So these are states which are, they're subjective and they are indeed objective to some extent. You could actually measure the amount of salt or you could measure the volume of that. But in your brain, that is calibrated based on the context and, and you know, previous information and priors. So, so... There is no direct contact reality. It is a simulation and a representation of the external world, hence the word representation, a representation of the information that has been extracted. That, that process of extraction is not perfect. Uh, it fills in missing gaps. It's a prediction hypothesis. It kind of makes certain assumptions. Um, and yet, of course, um, once the brain has decided on a solution or interpretation or a model, it then internally generates a representation which fits as if you really were seeing the thing you think you saw. So that I think is kind of very spooky and magical and weird, but I think incredibly profound because it means that you are recombining the information to create a model in your head. Uh, and I, I think that's a, I think that's a really interesting kind of idea. Which, which points us to the importance of having the right beliefs to have a grasp of a good grasp of this experience, right? Because if your uh, deep-rooted beliefs are, quote-unquote, maybe in a wrong direction, that's subjective, but your sense of reality might be altered through your whole lifetime. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I think it's important to recognize that um, we are, um, we can be victims of our own biases, and we should recognize the extent to which we are manipulated and the information we're provided with is, is deliberately, you know, um, filtered. Um, we should, I think, again, it's fine. I mean, he said the easiest person to fool is yourself. <laughs> and um, I think it's worth, you know, bearing that in mind as we bring to an end here, that that's the take-home message. Um, everyone thinks they're rational. Everyone thinks they have above, intelli above average intelligence. Everyone thinks they have above average senses of humor. Everyone thinks they're above average, but it's statistically that's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to recognize that whilst we hold these very positive illusions, they are illusions. And we, we have to recognize that we are fallible and our decision making and our choices are not necessarily ours. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of where I'd like to leave it. Would you, would you say that that's a good system to filter out your biology to make better belief systems? Uh, I don't know about that. I'm going to have to go now. I thought okay. we were ending um, it to an end. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Let me just ask you one quick question. What's one question that keeps you up at night still? Well, I don't think, I, I don't think there are questions which keep me up at night. I mean, basically, I'm a magpie. And that, I mean that, or an intellectual magpie, which means that I flit from questions to questions. Um, I mean, there are some intractable questions like the nature of consciousness, which are kind of probably never likely to be answered um, by any kind of mechanism we have in the moment. Um, 
but I, 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 I don't want to be lost in the abyss of uh, questions which can't provide satisfying answers, which goes back to what I said earlier on about the most satisfying thing of what I do is, is when, you re when you discover an explanation. So mm -hmm. um, the questions which keep me up at night will vary. Um, and if, they, if I don't get an answer, then I, I move on to something where there is actually some progress that could be made. Wonderful. Wonderful, Bruce. It was a okay. really delightful experience talking to you and hopefully we were able to share. Uh, I was able to deepen my consciousness and hopefully people benefit as well. And um, where can people find you and what's your next work after your current book, The Science of Happiness? Yeah, well, you can find me at brucehood.com. I now have a website which has my books and some of my talks. And I, I, I post uh, whenever I'm doing some live events there. And uh, I'm working on a new book, um, which I don't want to say anything about at the moment because it could be quite controversial. And I don't want my any anybody online to give me grief just in case I never actually get to get around to publishing it. But it would be very controversial. But that's what we need. Like science is always about breaking that limits and boundaries, right? Yeah. Well, that was psychologist Bruce Hood sharing the nature of human identity, why we have beliefs, and much more interesting facts about us. If you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to subscribe and share it among your peers. Do check out our other videos as well. Until next time, this is your host Raj signing off from The Seekers Mind Talks, the science and spiritual podcast.